Welcome to Social Allo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God while exposing the devil. It is important to maintain your integrity. If you make a vow, it is important to keep it. However, there are times when the best thing for you to do is to actually break a vow. Especially, for example, if you made a vow and then later you found out that Maybe rather than making a vow to the Lord, you actually end up making a deal with the devil. In situations like that, it is important to break a vow. Or if you made a vow to someone who actually tried to deceive you, it is important to break the vow. It is good to keep promises, but some promises should be broken because it will actually be better in the long run. However, vows should not be taken lightly. They should not be made frivolously. Under the law of God, also known as the law of Moses or the Mosaic laws, in Deuteronomy, or correction, in Numbers 30, verse 2, it states, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to to all that proceeded of his mouth. But there's one thing to note. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, do not allow the devil to keep you in bondage because you either knowingly or unknowingly, willingly or unwillingly, made a vow to him. There is redemptive power in the blood of Christ. But quite frankly, there are times when you may make a vow to the Lord, one that you intended to keep, but things happen along the way. So again, there is redemptive power in the blood of Christ. And you may have to ask the Lord, if you made a vow to him, that at the point in time you intended to keep, that you may have to plead for his mercy. Which is also important where do not let desperation ever be your source of inspiration. Because a lot of times people have said in desperation where, Lord, if you do this, then I will do that. When quite frankly, they just want to get out of the situation where they didn't really mean to keep it. So please be very careful about making vows. Yet, just because you make a vow, it doesn't mean that you're condemned to a life of misery. But to show you how serious it was, especially back under law about making vows, look at the life of a man named um, Jephthah. In Judges 11, starting verse 30, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Another thing to note, and this is one of those things that will determine whether the Lord extends his scepter of grace or not is whether you made that vow freely or if there was any compulsion, manipulation behind that vow. With Jephthah, he made the vow of his free will. He said the Lord, if the Lord gave him victory, that he would make a sacrifice to whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of his house to meet him. That was a vow of his free will, his absolute free will. So Jephthah passed over the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Aror even till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before 
the children of Israel. And I pause for a second. So Jephthah had a great victory. But the thing is, Jephthah didn't have to make the vow to the Lord in order to get those victories. But he made it anyhow. So be very careful about making a vow. And especially one as open-ended as this. For example, if my memory serves me right, it was Jacob who made a vow to the Lord, saying that if he blessed him, that he would give him a tenth. If he blessed him, he would give him a tenth. But this year, this vow was very open-ended. And it continues, And Jephthah came to Mizpeh unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. That was horrible for Jephthah. He had made a vow to the Lord. But the first thing that came to meet him out of his house, he would sacrifice. And the first thing out of his house, after gaining those victories, was his only child. What do you think happened? In verse 39 of Judges 11, And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed. And she knew no man, and it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Giladite, four days in a year. So because Jephthah made that vow to the Lord, and under the, the law of Moses, the law of God, when a person made a vow, the person had to keep it. But it doesn't say if Jephthah appealed to the Lord, But he went ahead and did what he said. That must have been very painful. But again, Jephthah did not, did not have to make a vow to the Lord like that in order to get those victories. He did of his own free will. So please be very careful about making those kind of vows. But there are times when you have to exercise wisdom regarding vows that you make. For example, in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 1, David was on his deathbed. Adonijah, his eldest living son, made the assumption that because he was the eldest son, that he was going to take over as king. And he kind of set himself up as being king. But the Lord had already said that Solomon was going to be David's successor. But David hadn't formally made the proclamation. David was given Abishag the Shunammite as his, um, his concubine. But he didn't touch her before he died. David passed away, but before he did, he let it be known that Solomon was his successor. Starting verse 50 of 1 Kings 1. And Adonijah feared because of Solomon, and arose and went and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feared King Solomon, for lo, he had caught hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. So he wanted Solomon 
to make a vow. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of him fall to the earth. But wickedness, but if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. And Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. So Solomon basically made a vow to not kill him as long as there is no wickedness found in him. It was a vow. But in 1 Kings 2, starting verse 13, And Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And she said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. He said, Moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee, and she said, Say on. And he said, Thou knowest that the kingdom was mine, that all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. Howbeit the kingdom is turned about, and is become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. For it was his from the Lord. So Adonijah was acknowledging that the Lord was the one who had appointed Solomon as David's successor. Even though Solomon was not the eldest living son, and even though you know the circumstances from 2 Samuel 11 and how David and Bathsheba, how that relationship started. Yet Solomon was the Lord's chosen one. And now I ask one petition of thee, deny me not. And she said unto him, Say on. And he said, Speak, I pray thee, unto Solomon the king, for he will not say nay, that he give me Abishag the Shunammite to wife. And Bathsheba said, Well, I will speak for thee unto the king. And Bathsheba, or correction, Bathsheba, therefore went unto King Solomon, to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to his feet and bowed himself to her and sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother and she sat at on his right hand. Then she said, I desire one small petition of thee, I pray thee, say me not nay. So she's saying, do not say no. And the king said unto her, Ask on my mother, for I will not say nay. King Solomon gave his word to not say no. Which, by the way, points to nothing. It is very, or it can be potentially dangerous, to get into a, an agreement without knowing the full details. If a person is trying to do something deceptively, then it will take time to know the, the entire details, but be very careful about getting into an agreement without knowing the full details. Sometimes a person's motive behind doing certain things. And she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah thy brother to wife. Now she went there representing Adonijah, but she was doing something out of ignorance, something that could have serious consequences but Solomon had already told her that he would not say no so should he keep his word or should he break it and King Solomon answered and said unto his mother and why dost thou ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him, and for Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swear by the Lord, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah, Adonijah 
have not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord liveth, which hath established me and set me on the throne of my father, of David my father, and who hath made me an house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death this day. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell upon him that died. Adonijah, Solomon had told Adonijah that he would live as long as there is no wickedness found in him. But then Adonijah went to Bathsheba in an effort to marry Abishag, the Shunammite, David's concubine, in an effort to pry the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. But even though Solomon had told his mother that he would not deny her request, he had to deny it because of the sinister motive behind it. He had to break that vow to her because of the sinister motive behind it. She didn't realize it, but when he caught it, it's like, uh-uh. So he was not going to keep his word in that way. But he was going to keep the other word that he made, that Adonijah would die if there was wickedness found in him. And there are times when you may find yourself in a conflicting situation. We may have two vows that you have made and you have to determine which one is going to take precedence. Flipping to the, the New Testament in Matthew chapter 14. There are times when people have those two vows and it's like an ethical dilemma. Which one are you going to choose? Not necessarily an ethical dilemma, but in Matthew 14, starting the first verse. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore, mighty works to do forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. So he had taken his brother's wife as his own. And when he have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. So Herodias' daughter seduced King Herod and because he was in that place of lust, he told Herodias' daughter that he would give her whatsoever she asked him for. He made a vow to give her whatsoever she asked him for. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat. And he commanded it to be given unto her. So he had made a vow, an oath, that he was sorry for. But in an attempt to save face with people, he went and did it anyhow to execute John the Baptist. And he sent and beheaded John in prison, and his head was brought in him in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And she brought it to her mother. In 1 Kings 16, 
it introduces Jezebel. It later goes on to talk about how Jezebel used to kill the Lord's prophet. Herodias and Jezebel kind of function the same type of spirit. They were evil. With Herodias' daughter, she didn't want John the Baptist dead, but she was doing what her mother wanted. So her mother was controlling her. If you make a vow to a person or to people who are being controlled by the devil, you may want to consider not keeping that vow. There's a difference between making a vow to the Lord and one to the devil. Because quite frankly, there are times when you may, make, you may make a vow and you may think you're making it to the Lord. When the truth is revealed, you'll find out that the devil was behind it all. But even when you find that out, the devil will try to tell you that you made a vow and that you should keep your vow. May he throw scriptures at you. And this is not a teaching to tell you that you should say things that you have no intention of keeping. No. But don't be in bondage, especially to the devil. And if you made a vow to the Lord and you made it in error, the Lord is merciful. Ask him. In Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, but who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The devil will try to condemn you with a vow that you made. But there are times when the Lord will actually release you from the vow because he is merciful. In First, First John 1, it starts, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness, and show you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare unto you, that ye also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is no darkness in God. So if you made a vow, and there is deceit associated with it, that was not of God. If you made a vow and there was deceit associated with it, that was not of God. All the more justification for you to see the Lord to break that vow. There is redemptive power in the blood of Jesus. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I say that again. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So in Romans 8.1, where it tells you that there is therefore now no condemnation 
to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then here in 1 John 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no agreement you can make with the devil that the Lord cannot redeem you from. If you made an agreement with the devil, whether knowingly or unknowingly, willingly or unwillingly, turn to the Lord. And if you made a vow to the Lord that quite frankly is too difficult for you to keep, seek the Lord. In some cases, the Lord has simply been waiting for you to say that it is too much for you to bear and you cannot do it on your own for him to relieve you of the responsibility. Turn to the Lord. Cast your cares on him. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares about you.